can still remember the first time I played Boulder's Gate. I remember it so clearly because it was quite literally the best Christmas ever. That Christmas I received two magical boxes, containing the games that I'd seen in PC Gamer, and spent months waiting to finally play. In one box was Boulder's Gate 1 and 2, and in the other, Shogun Total War. These games still rank among my top 10 games of all time, and probably will always as I slowly turn into a nostalgic boomer. But today I want to talk about something less pleasant. I want to talk about Larian Games' Divinity 3. Wait, no. I want to talk about how Larian Games exploited a classic Bioware IP to make a game that isn't a Baldur's Gate game. I know you're probably hovering over the dislike button right now, and that's totally understandable. But seriously, as a longtime D&D nerd and Baldur's Gate fan, please hear me out. I can remember the first conversation I had about BG3 being announced. I said to a longtime fellow BG2 nerd back from the days on GameSpy Arcade, and I said, hell, I hope it isn't just a Larian game reskinned into a D&D 5e rule set. Well, I mean, it is. And anyone who argues otherwise is crazy. But, old man Banjo, you say, Larian games make amazing RPGs. Why would you hate on that? Well, first of all, I'm not a big Divinity fan. The games are good, but for me, they are nowhere on par with a lot of famous classic RPGs such as the Fallout games, Baldur's Gate, KOTOR, and Mass Effect. But this is not a video about why you shouldn't like the Divinity games. I know a lot of people, especially younger people than me, got into CRPGs through Divinity, and that's totally awesome. This video is about why Larian Games' interpretation of the Baldur's Gate franchise is not faithful to that very same franchise, and ultimately, in my view, amounts to a reskin that is simply Divinity 3. A franchise that is completely respectable in its own right, but isn't Baldur's Gate. First off, let's talk about the companions. Oh my god, if you've ever played tabletop D&D, you should know what I'm talking about immediately here. In Boulder's Gate 2, the companions are either evil, lovable, eccentrics, or people close and important to you. They all have reasons to be with you. Some noble like Khalid and Jahira, who are seeking to protect you after the death of your stepfather. Spoilers. Or maybe less so, like Edwin. But none of them are edgy. Okay, maybe Edwin is a little bit edgy. But their reasons are clear. They have genuine conflict, and most of them have a genuine sense of concern for the player character, even if the player character doesn't reciprocate that specific concern. When you first meet Minsk and Edwin, you have a direct conflict involving Dinihir. You have two characters with opposing motives. If you follow through with their quests, you can gain a loving, yet arguably dense companion in Minsk, or the best cunning mage in the game. The characters and their ties to start off reasonably nonchalant, there is something they need done and you're there to help them. But the tension or edginess derives from the fact that you can't satisfy them both. You can't both be Mint's best friend and Edwin's. You've got to make a choice. And that choice makes you decide who you are in Faerun. And these more edgy and complicated characters are supplemented by a few characters that really just like and support the player character. And they're there for you if you need them. Again, this adds to your sense of choice. Baldur's Gate 3, on the other hand, introduces the companions with a completely different philosophy. These companions are, in general, unamicable to player character. They don't like you and are suspicious of you. As Jim Salter from Ars Technicana put it, your cleric, who despises you, has no interest in your problems. So she cheerfully allows the rogue to try to backstab you. She continues to ignore the whole incident while the two of you roll around in the dirt with his knife at your neck. One way or another, the encounter ends with him and your party, but nobody feels good about it. If that leaves a bad taste in your mouth, buckle in, because it's about to get worse. Immediately after recruiting the rogue, you encounter three distressed stranded fishfolk who believe they're excavating an injured child from the rubble. The child is an illithid who is mind-controlling them, and if you want them to believe you, you need to pass a rather difficult charisma check. If you pass the check, they express shock, loathing, and distrust of you before fleeing. 
If you failed the check, the illicit convinces them you want the child to die, and it's civilian murdering. Yay! This reflects the general problem with Baldur's Gate 3. The only thing that binds you and your companions together is circumstance, and it's circumstance that could have been contrived by Michael Bay. We'll get to that later. But this reflects a more general problem. If you've ever been in a one-shot Dungeons & Dragons campaign, you might know the sort of feeling that Jim was talking about there. You don't have a chance to fully prep the campaign, so all your characters just get thrown together. You need to kill X or do Y. And this gets me to my second point. Larian Games views storytelling in RPGs the way a one-shot DM views a game with his friends on a Saturday afternoon that he hasn't really prepped for, and that's inexcusable. The failings of Baldur's Gate 3 reflect a more general failing on Larian's part to understand how D&D 5e is best played. Yeah, I know that sounds ignorant as hell to tell people how to play a tabletop RPG. And you can play a tabletop RPG however you like. But the reality is different rule sets for tabletop RPGs are designed for different storytelling purposes. You have Call of Cthulhu because you want to play a Lovecraftian style game. You have Monster of the Week, of which I am personally a huge fan because we all want to be Dean from Supernatural. Maybe that's just me. Anyways, the reality is that the 5e rule set as it's currently devised is meant to be a nice middle ground between giving players the freedom to express themselves in a narrative world with some clear combat scenarios. And Larian leans so heavily into combat, but in a way that negatively affects storytelling. That is to say, the 5e rule set is clearly designed around the players being invested in the world and giving the DM the tools to let the players explore that interest. In Boulder's Gate, this sort of outlook on DMing and exploring the world was clearly expressed. Emma Wynn is kidnapped. We don't know where she is. And we've got to get her back. And to do so, we need to explore the world. We need to make money. We need to make contacts. In this strange land that we've never been to before. In order to gain both the financial and physical power to rescue her from a place that initially we don't even know where she is. You're given free reign to define who we are as part of this narrative. We have a goal, but how we get there has so many different paths. However, in Divinity 3, sorry, Baldur's Gate 3, the opposite is true. I literally went through a quest where the quest giver asked me to kill someone, no spoilers, in the opposite room. When I explored other options, he's just simply insisted I walk into the next room and killed her. I then checked on YouTube if there was some sort of nuance to this quest progression I was missing. Nope. I was supposed to walk into the next room and kill the person the other person in the other room wanted. Larian Games thinks that 5e is meant to be played as murder hobos. They want a quest giver to ask you to do X to kill Y. And all interactions can be reduced to agree with or kill without thinking about whether these individual narratives are giving room for story progression or character growth. Narrative is a pretense for violence or combat, and debate is merely a way to stretch out or avoid certain scenarios. The TLDR, Larian games are a bunch of murder hobos. You can see it in the Divinity games, and that's fine. Murder hoboing can be very fun sometimes, but it isn't in the spirit of Boulder's Gate. And this gets me finally to the worst aspects of Baldur's Gate 3, and that is its early access status. Narrative games in early access were, as far as I can tell, pioneered by Telltale Games. The idea of having a story-centric game you couldn't complete without waiting for the full complete release. The way they did this in episodic form was initially attractive. It had the same feel of waiting for the new season of your HBO TV series. The narrative capped off, but you had to wait for the next episode. But this is horrible, horrible for a CRPG. A CRPG is a unified experience. To end up replaying sections or waiting years between progression destroys narrative cohesion. Imagine playing $60 to play through Mass Effect 2 over a three year period. There is literally no excuse for this as a business practice. I cannot figure out why more people are not put off by this. Yes, there has been some criticism, but in my view, not at all enough of this usage of early access for narrative-based games 
it simply does not work unless you're Telltale Games. Oh, wait, they went out of business. The experience of playing the original Infinity Games condenses for me whole phases of my life. It's not an engine or a playground to be messed around or experimented with, like a game of Fallout 4 or Skyrim. CRPGs are more similar to binge-watching a TV show than playing World of Warcraft. Releasing the game on early access was an incredible mistake and an attempt to avoid commitment to a fully-fledged narrative. And this gets me to my final point. Bad storytelling. Most Infinity Engine games, like a good tabletop RPG, start slow. They know the player needs space to fill out the world, and their characters need to play within it. Even more mainstream RPGs like Fallout 4 give you that space at the start of the game before the action begins to get a feel for the world and what you want your character to be within it. Baldur's Gate 1 had you start out on the road to the friendly arm in, finding the odd gibbons and, and meeting a few eccentrics. Baldur's Gate 2 had you start in a prison, puzzled as to how you got here from the events of the following game, but reunited with your companions and to soon discover a strange and alien new world. But not Baldur's Gate 3. But no, man, we're going on full level 16 illithid mind flayer ships and brainworms and interplanetary ships crashing into God knows where. How many Wizards of the Coast D&D 5e modules start this way? None. Why? Because everyone knows that it's bad Dungeons and Dragons. D&D is not a Michael Bay movie. In fact, nothing good is a Michael Bay movie. But when your company CEO thinks acquiring this IP is simply an excuse to LARP in full body armor, this is In summary, Divinity 3 fails to be Baldur's Gate 3 because the developers don't understand what made Baldur's Gate 3 amazing to begin with. And I don't think they understand what makes for a really good D&D roleplay experience. And they're reflecting their failures as role players to grasp what was good about Baldur's Gate 2 and taking that into their game design. What we should take away from this is that what made the original Infinity games so great wasn't just the game design or the awesome art. It was the understanding the developers had of what makes a good roleplay experience and their experience of TTRPGs and the way they applied that to the games they produced. Thanks for hearing me out, and this is Old Man Banjo. I'll see you next week.